dear friends, and welcome to our service of worship here today. It's really a joy and a privilege to see you in person, to be here, and to claim the goodness of God in all things. Amen? Amen. Scripture reminds us that every day is a new day, an opportunity for joy, and the psalm says, this is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad. And that's why we're here. I want to welcome uh, the, the family and families that are here for our baptism today. It's a privilege to have you in worship and to remember one of our primary focuses in living out our faith is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And so baptism is an opportunity for us to claim our role of discipleship and discipleship making and it, it is our privilege. Today as we come in worship, um, my announcements are few, which is good news. Um, and I just want to remind us of our, our worship schedule. Um, we resumed our four in-person services. So we have a Saturday at five o'clock in the chapel, and then Sunday mornings we have eight o'clock in the chapel, nine o'clock contemporary and fellowship hall, and this service. But we added a service. We now have five unique worship services. The one that we added, you can't come to. You can only let it come to you. It's, it's called our online only service. And at six o'clock on Saturdays, um, we have a service that broadcasts on YouTube and on, on Facebook. And if you don't want to watch it or worship on Saturday, you can worship on demand. Do you, do you watch anything on demand? And people's lives are on demand. We know that people have field hockey right now. And there are kids who are playing soccer right now. And there are people who don't feel comfortable coming to church in per person. And there are people who are living around the country and around the world that we would love to share our worship service with. So I share that with you for two reasons. One is if you find yourself in a position where you can't come to worship in person, the service is for you. But also it's, it is a, an evangelism tool for us to meet people where they are. So if you have friends that haven't been in church or if you have family members who live far away who don't have a church, I invite you to share this service with them. So if you go to youtube.com slash Haddonfield UMC, you will find our online only worship service and you can watch it anytime and you can share it. Um, and then today we have volunteers out in the Welcome Center who have black shirts with our church logo. And they're here to, to encourage people to learn more about our small group ministries. We believe that faith is not a solo enterprise, but it is a relationship-based journey. So if you would like to get into a small group or learn more about a small group, please see our table and our volunteers in the Welcome Center. And in the very last page of this bulletin, You'll see it says relationships are central on the inside of the back. And there is a list of our existing small groups and information of how you can get involved and learn more. So in the spirit of worship, claiming God's goodness and giving God thanks, I invite Pastor G. Sun to lead us in our call to worship. And I invite you to stand as you're able. Good morning. Please join our responsible call to worship. You can find the word in the bulletin. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with his singing. Praise be to God, who is good all the time. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. We give God praise for all that God has done, is doing, and will continue to do. Amen. I invite you to turn our hymnal number 421, Make Me a Captive Lord, for our uh, praise.
you all hear me? The sacrament of baptism is a holy and joyous moment in which we get to expand our, our community, expand our heart, and to claim God's grace on a new sister today in faith. And so I want to welcome um, our baptismal family to come forward. And I invite you all to turn to page 39 in your hymnal. And I invite our lay leader forward for the baptism So brothers and sisters in Christ, it is through the sacrament of baptism that we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. And so as parents of Harper Ray, I, inv I invite you to answer these questions, these historic and traditional questions of the church. On behalf of the whole congregation, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. And do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. As Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her service to others. We will pray for her that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scripture of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the end. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you, you can now close your hymnals and we'll be present to what God is doing. Water is a very common element essential to all life. It gives us life, it washes us, it nurtures us. And here today, we use water as an outward sign of an inward grace that God is already doing in Harper Ray's life. So I invite you to uh, join your spirit with mine as we pray over this water. Loving and, li and living God, we give you thanks for the gift of water and how it nurtures, cleans, cleanses, heals, and gives us life. Throughout history, oh God, you have worked in and through water. When all was chaos, your spirit hovered over the face of the deep. Through water, you brought about a covenant with your people, not to bring destruction, but to bring love and redemption. Through the waters of the Jordan, you brought Jesus and claimed him as your beloved and sent him forth to heal us and to show him your reign on earth. And O oh God, be present in these waters. Bless them that they may be an outward sign of an inward and invisible grace in this child and a reminder that we have all been watermarked with your grace. 
And we pray, amen. Okay, how's she doing? Okay, all right. All right. Harper Ray Sandmeyer, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. Now, can you just play, place your hand on Harper Ray? And I'll invite you if you want to extend a hand, and that way you also are blessing Harper. The Holy Spirit works within you, that being born through the water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. 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 And our traditional response is uh, for you to get closer to the congregation. And today we're not going to do that. But we are going to invite you to stand here. And uh, we're going to sing our, our baptismal response, Jesus Loves Me. So, and let's, let's sing together. We welcome her to our congregation.
One of great privileges for God's children is a time of prayer, pouring out our heart, who is listening to us and who is always good and faithful to us. I don't know where you are in your life journey or your heart condition of heart today, but our God knows about your heart, your need, and your prayer. And so I want to invite you to go to God in prayer in this community of faith with a humble and honest heart. Please join me in prayer. God of love and mercy, thank you so much for many gifts of life given us to love more and to serve more. Thank you for being our God and being the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thank you for being for many people around us sharing their lives with us, sharing their joys and, and tears sometimes, prayers and concerns. We pray for one another and ask your mercy on those in need of your help and guidance today. For those whose burdens are too heavy, give them your rest. For those who are mourning, grant your peace, coming only from the intimate relationships with you. For those who get hurt in many relationships, give them your restoration. For those who seek a direction of their lives, open the doors of new opportunity. We pray for those who are lonely, who ever feel themselves strangers in the world. May your presence ensure companionship. We pray for all in illness and pain, and weary of the day and fearful of the night. Grant your healing in the way you prepared in your time. We pray for our community who, who are sharing this life journey and faith journey together. We are so different, but we are one in Christ. Oh God, help us to be quick to listen and slow to speak, quick to love and slow to anger. Bless us to be blessings for others and shape us to be faithful disciples and make your disciples in the world. Oh God, we lift up our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and we seal these prayers with the one who taught us how to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to invite you to stand if we are able for our hymn of praise Hymn, no, hymn number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And please join to sing.
Good morning. The word of the living God for today is Proverbs 3, 1 through 10. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes, for the Lord, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh and a refreshment for your body. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. How do you navigate unfamiliar territory or uncertain circumstances? How do you figure out what decisions to make and how to find your way forward? Me, I trust my gut. I trust my instincts. I think I have pretty good intuition. I've seen a lot. When I was on my honeymoon 18 years ago, my wife and I had just gotten married and we were staying at a resort in the Caribbean. And one of the many packages that was being marketed to us was one to rent a sailboat, just a small little uh, Hobie cat to go out sailing. And when we signed up to rent the boat at the resort, there was fine print that's, that said if you had never been sailing before, you were required to take a class at 8 o'clock in the morning, the day before you were to take the boat. And I asked my wife, my new wife, if, if she had ever been sailing before, and indeed she had, with her family when she was a teenager. So that was enough, right? That qualified us as far as the, far, the small print was concerned. And, after all, I grew up along the Allegheny River, Right? I was on fishing boats and kayaks and canoes. And come on, how hard can it be, really? It's not much different. So, we got on the sailboat. And my, immediately my gut kicked in and I could feel the power of the wind pulling the sail one direction. So, I, with very good intuition, decided to pull the sail this way and it paid off. Man, we were flying right out into the ocean. The sun was beaming on us, the wind was in the sail, blowing through our, our hair, we were newlyweds. This was paradise, and the best thing was that now I could say, I was a veteran sailor, right? I had figured this thing out. And we were cruising out into the ocean, having a wonderful time, until we looked back at the beach and the people just kept getting smaller and smaller. And Kimberly said, Chris, we're out too far. We better turn around. And that sounded like wise counsel. So I figured if the sail turned this way, sent us forward, the best thing to do was to turn the sail the opposite way and we would turn around. And so I grabbed the sail with all my might. I turned it against the wind to the other side and we stopped dead in the water. And I tried desperately to beat her to it to stop what she was about to say. I knew we should have taken the lesson, right? It's going to be fine. I've got this. I'll figure this out, right? And so I pulled the sail in the middle to try and figure that out. And that didn't work. And I rocked it back and forth to the point where I almost was thrown off the boat. And then I decided that the only thing I knew how to do was to bring the sail back this way. And I did. And it worked. And we were going out into the ocean again even more. So by the time the rescue boat showed up, <laughs> I was moments away from figuring it out. 
And, and I told him so as well. I told the guy on the boat, I said, you know, you, you came out a little too early. I, I was going to figure this out. And he dropped his head and just, you know, he probably had seen hundreds of arrogant Americans do this, right? And he just tisked me. He said, you should have taken the lesson. Now, 18 years later, we laugh at this story, and we both have our own version of this story. But the reality is, is that when we are in over our heads, it's good to have a good head on your shoulders and to be good on your feet, but sometimes it's not enough, right? Sometimes no matter what we know or think we know, we don't know everything we need to know. And our own intuition sometimes is insufficient to help us to figure out the next steps, particularly when circumstances beyond our control change in difficult ways. Now, I went back and I decided that I would like to know how one turns a sailboat in case I were to ever go back out. It says, sudden or sharp turns will slow the boat down, stick to gradual turns. So that was my that was my primary initial problem, was that I tried to control the situation immediately and turn it. I thought the sailboat was like a car, right? You want to go left, you turn left, you want to go, and it didn't work that way. So I tried to wrest control from the wind, and that is what caused me to lose momentum. And then it says you must maintain effective sail trim throughout the turn by sheeting the sail in or out as you turn, if you don't maintain proper sail trim throughout the, the turn, your boat will slow down or stop moving. And what we have sailors who are part of this congregation, people who were in the military, and, and they assured me that what I should have done was to let the wind take me and then slowly kind of uh, rock back and forth and let the wind drive the turn rather than me try to turn the wind, right? I tried to turn the wind. Now, we are now two weeks into a new series called What's Next? Moving Forward in Uncertain Times. And I think this is a pressing question for many of us as we are living in an unprecedented moment and we are living with all kinds of layers of uncertainty in our lives. Not just pandemic-related, but health-related, relationship-related, work-related, school-related, uncertainty. How do we figure out what's next and how to get there? And, the, and the, the, in the parentheses, how to get there without losing our minds, right? That's the real key. Well, the book of Proverbs is filled with, with amazing wisdom, and it's under-preached on in pulpits. And today I wanted to look at Proverbs chapter 3, which um, you heard read so wonderfully. At the very beginning, the, King Solomon, of whom this text is attributed, he says, Do not forget my teaching. But let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. Here it says, if you keep my commandments, meaning God's commandments, length of days, years of life, and abundant welfare they will give you. It does not say you will avert all crises. It says you will live a long time, which implies you'll probably have to live through a lot of crises, right? Abundant days doesn't mean... Um, all smooth sailing, right? If, if you live long and you endure a lot, then you have to go through a lot of situations that are beyond your control. So this promise is not that you're going to avoid illness or conflict or trouble, but what it promises is if you stick close to the commandments of God, you will have a buoyancy to survive and not be pulled down underwater. And I, I want to just address this word commandments. I think in the 21st century, it has a negative connotation to it. Um, if I were to say to my kids, you need to listen to my commands, right? They're going to roll their eyes and do the opposite of whatever I say. And I, th I think the word command feels like a heavy-handed finger wag. But I want to remove that connotation and look at how it would have been heard a thousand years before Jesus lived, which is the time in which this text would have been written. The commandments were not seen as a burden to the people of Israel. They were seen as a gift. A gift that God gave them. Because the Israelites, after being in Egypt, were a group of people about to kill each other. They were lost in the desert. They were going to starve to death. And there was a mutiny afoot. People were, rebel were rebelling against their leader. But no one had a better plan than him. And so God gave Moses a law 
which was a gift to the people so that they could get their act together and live peace of, peacefully with each other and in the world so God could bless them. And there are over 600 codes in, in the law of Moses or the Torah. And these codes, I think, have three primary purposes as a gift for the people. It taught them how to be in right relationship with God, right? Respect God. Show God reverence. Know that God isn't here for our purposes, but we're here for God's purposes. Don't take God's name in vain. Don't, don't cheat on God with other idols, but remember that God is the creator. And a second purpose for the law of Israel is right relationship with one another. How to get along. I want to live in a society where the crime rate is low, right? I want to live in a society that is great promise for me and for my kids and for my neighbors. And I want to live in a society where we can get along and there's a sense of belonging and prosperity. And so the law of Israel was ge geared around not stealing from your neighbor. Don't kill. Don't, don't covet or be jealous of your neighbor's success or things or relationships. And, and to live justly and peaceably. And to take care of the widow and the orphan and, and those who are on the bottom as well as those who are on top. Live in right relationship with one another. This is what the scripture means about commandments. And then the third purpose, I think, of the law of Israel, and, and we usually overlook it. it. It had baked into it ways to take care of yourself. Have you ever heard the term, the phrase self-care? It's a phrase that gets thrown, to, thrown at clergy a lot. Are you caring for yourself? You know, what are you doing for self-care? What's your self-care plan? I love the, there are always retreats for self-care, which take away from work that would help us to feel better about what we're doing so we can focus on, right? But baked into the society of Israel was first and foremost a rule that said every six days you need to stop. Stop everything. Stop working, stop stressing, stop running. Rest, catch up on your sleep, catch up on your family time, spend time with your kids, right? That today, literature and magazines and, and talk shows and self-help books all try and help us to lower our stress rate. And a lot of times it points to we need to rest better take care of ourselves and to sleep. And so when the scripture talks about commandments, it's talking about take care of yourself. And, and the, the laws around food in, in the code of, of Israel in the Torah, it was about, it was saying the same thing that do doctors are saying to us today. Don't eat garbage, right? Don't eat fatty foods that are going to raise your triglycerides and your blood pressure. And it was trying to help people to eat well, to rest well, to take care of themselves, to live peaceably with their neighbor, and to respect God. And so Solomon is saying, if you do these things, you will be able to endure whatever life gives you. Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, was first and foremost a rabbi. He was an interpreter of the law, a teacher. In chapter 22, he's quizzed by a, a, a lawyer, by a, a Pharisee. And the Pharisee says, O oh, oh teacher, which is the greatest of all the rules? It was an attempt to trap Jesus. And Jesus said, perhaps you know the answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. That's Deuteronomy 6.4. And then Jesus says there's another one like it that comes from Leviticus. Love your neighbor as yourself. These two rules are the spirit under which all the rules fall. And so I would say as followers of Christ, what the scripture says to us is if we focus on loving God and loving our neighbor in times of uncertainty, we will find what we need. But the problem and the question is how. That sounds really easy, Chris. But how do I really do that? And it requires this word that's found in verse 5 of Proverbs 3. And, it, and the word is not belief. In church, a lot of times we talk about belief. And I think in the questions I asked our baptismal parents today, do you believe, right? But this scripture doesn't say anything about belief. It says trust. Trust in the Lord and not on your own understanding. I should have read that verse before I went sailing, right? Because sometimes... Our understanding is not enough. I worry about next month, 
And I try and plan about next month. And I try and anticipate next month. And I try and tr solve next month's problems today. But the reality is, is I have no idea what's going to happen next month. Right? The things I think are going to break maybe aren't broken. And the things I think are fine might not be fine. And the only real option I have is to trust that God knows better than I know. And to focus on the only thing I really can control, which is how I'm nurturing my relationship with God, loving God, and my relationship with neighbor as myself. Now the opposite, I have to say, is too often true, is when, when I am out of control or when we are in situations where, where we don't know what is happening, we thrash around. It's like being in waters too deep. Instead of swimming and floating, we thrash around trying to grab something which only causes us to go down more. And when, we, when we're thrashing around, often we say hurtful things and do hurtful things instead of focusing on sharing love, compassion, and grace anyway, even in uncertain times. Several years ago, I worked for the mission agency of the United Methodist Church. It was a humanitarian and human relief agency. And my work there took me to a number of countries around the world. I traveled pretty often, and it was in most of the time it was in the developing world, in Asia, Latin America, and in Africa. And pretty early on, I realized that when I was going into um, a developing area that, that I really was in over my head and I could get into trouble if I tried to anticipate what was going to happen. And I remember um, de developing a strategy that I wasn't going to spend a lot of time in trying to, f to learn a whole lot about where I was going. Instead, what I invested time in was figuring out who I could trust. So I would do a lot of research as to who was going to be my guide in the country, whether it was a missionary or a pastor or a staff person of a project. But I asked all the recommendations in the world, and I figured out who was from that culture, from that place I could trust. And when I traveled that way, as opposed to studying a map and figuring out where I should go, I realized that I ate better food. I uh, had more authentic encounters with people. And I had overall a more meaningful experience as opposed to staying in hotels, eating restaurant food, and going only to tourist sites. So in 2008, in January, I visited Sierra Leone for the first time. And I was traveling with a colleague who was younger than me and was super ambitious about travel. And this guy studied everything he could about Sierra Leone. He read every Wikipedia article that was in there and, and, and websites. And he came up with a plan for us and an itinerary. And, you know, I didn't, I learned a little bit, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time researching about Sierra Leone. Instead, I got all the recommendations I could as to who was the best person to be my guide. And I was told this guy, Phileas Jusu, was my man. And so I knew that Phileas was the guy I was meeting in the airport, and my plan was to go where Phileas told me to go, to eat what Phileas told me I could eat, and do what Phileas told me I should do. Well, when we got to Sierra Leone, it didn't take long for my approach and my colleague's approach to diverge, right? Phileas had recommended a plan for us, and my colleague said, oh, no, no, if we, after visiting this maternity center, if we can get on Highway 10 and go, leave from Bo, and it's only a two-hour drive across the countryside, we can visit three more spots on our way. And Phileas just kind of sat there with a smirk on his face. And then after my colleague was done, he said, yeah, we can't do that. And the colleague said, oh, yeah, we, all we have to do is take Route 10. And, and Phileas said, well, if you take Route 10 after 5 o'clock when the sun goes down, that's when the bandits come out and you're going to get kidnapped. Right? That wasn't in Wikipedia. Right? That wasn't in the little travel guide that you got at the airport. Right? Sometimes our own idea of what we need and what is best doesn't really add up to, to reality. And what we need to do in our journey of life, instead of trying to anticipate and control every detail, it's to hitch ourselves to the only guide who knows what's next better than we do. And that's God, who has God's own timing. There's a, there's a word for God's timing. Do you know what it is? Kairos. 
Kairos. I heard a sermon in New York once called From Kronos to Kairos. And, and the, the preacher was talking about moving from human timing, chronological order, Kronos, to God's timing. And he talked about having worked in Wall Street um, up until September 11th, 2001. And after that, and after what he saw and what he lived through, so many people like him left the financial industry and he went into ministry and he ultimately went on to be the dean of New York Theological School. He said he had a plan for his life, but God had another plan for his life. What, what he had in chronological anticipation was different than from what God had in Cairo's time. And God redeemed and used bad things for good. And so in this passage, it reminds us that no matter what uncertainty that we face, we trust God. But navigating uncertainty requires trust. Not that we will go where we want or get what we expect, but trust that wherever we go and whatever we get will be used by God for good. I, for my own sake, I think that's worth repeating. Navigating uncertainty requires trust. Not that we will go where we want or get what we expect, but whatever we get and wherever we go, it will be used by God for good. Paul says that God works for the good all those who love God. But how are we nurturing that love and that relationship with God? And how are we showing love, compassion, and mercy for other people? Those we know, those we don't know, those we agree with, and those we don't agree with. Because as we live out those covenants, there we will find God's blessing in our life. I think my spirit always comes back to the question, how? How do I do that? And I think the answer is let go. Let go of the sail, follow the wind, and rock into it. There's a prayer called the Serenity Prayer. Perhaps you're familiar with it. It was originally written by Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a pastor and teacher theologian in New York City, Union Seminary. Niebuhr wrote a, a, a longer version of this prayer than most people know in 1951. And I want to read this prayer for you. And I want to invite you to pray it with me. God, give me grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed. And the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Did you hear those words? Taking this world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that God will make all things right if I surrender to God's will. Friends, let us commit first and foremost to nurturing our love of God, to living out our love of neighbor, and let God take care of the rest. Amen. Trusting in the Lord beyond our own understanding, experience, or instinct is the journey from our head to our heart. It's not one-time event, but the journey requiring a lot of practice. And I know our offering is not simple donation, but spiritual practice to give up our comfort in some way and giving, letting go our desire of control, all our resources to God greater than ourselves and who loves you and me more than we can imagine and invites us to be a part of God's mission here. And so I want to encourage your giving, generous giving, uh, and I want to share the ways how to give. We are not passing the offering plate, but the, you can use the offering basket in the hallway or at the entrance, and or you can use our online giving on our website, headonfieldemc.org, or headonfieldemc mobile app. And not only for giving, but our headonfieldemc mobile app is a hub. You can find all the faith resources. 
can worship there, find the daily reflection, listen sermons, and you can find all the resources we produce there. So I encourage you to uh, go your app, App Store, and then find us by searching Head on Field UMC when you are available. And the, the other way is, of course, you can mail a check to the church office anytime. And let us continue our worship with Patty, who's going to share her gift in music with us.
Gracious giving God, we offer our gift to you in gratitude for all the blessings you rained down upon us. Your sunshine warms us, your earth feeds us, and your word nourishes us. More than these gifts of money, we give ourselves our time and energy and let it be the small seed of your love, your good news for people around us in and beyond our community. We pray in Jesus, our Christ's name, amen. Let us continue our worship with hymn number 128, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans I have for you, not plans for your destruction, but to have a future and a hope. We trust that we won't necessarily go where we want or get exactly what we expect, but wherever we go and whatever we get, God will use it for good, and God will be at work in our lives for good. So go in the goodness of God, the love and the grace of Jesus Christ, and may the Spirit bind us together until we meet again. Amen.